It's mostly quiet on Muriel Court, but that wasn't the case in 1966 when Robert Sims, his wife Helen, and young daughter Joy found gagged, stabbed, and shot to death. Safer politically to leave it alone. Who killed the Sims family in Tallahassee, Florida on October 22nd, 1966? Check out the new podcast, Massacre on Muriel Court, an in-depth, serialized podcast about this cold case. Subscribe now on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Moronic is the word that comes to mind. He's accusing two top officials of a cover-up. Standing back there under the banana tree. Hi everyone! Hello! I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends and every now and then a creepy place. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, plus early and ad-free episodes, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And be sure to check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, merch store, mailing list, links to our socials, and of course, our Patreon. We also have a little virtual tip jar there, so if you want to help out our show, just swing by there and give us a little tip, and we'll give you a shout on the show. All right, so... On August 7th, 1972, 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma left her home in Springfield Township, New Jersey to go visit a friend. She told her mother she would be taking the train, but some reports say she was hitchhiking, a common practice in the 1970s. Jeanette De Palma would never be seen alive again. Jeanette De Palma was born on August 3, 1956, to Salvatore and Florence De Palma. They were a large Italian family, and Jeanette had four sisters and three brothers. The De Palma family lived in the upper middle class New Jersey suburb of Springfield Township. Jeanette's family, according to newspaper articles, belonged to the Assemblies of God, Evangel Church, and Elizabeth. Now, Jeanette was said to be very devout in her faith and planned on attending a Bible college. And on August 8, 1972, the day after she was last seen, when Jeanette did not arrive at her friend's house or return home, her parents filed a missing persons report with the Springfield Police Department. On September 19, 1972, six weeks later, a dog returned from a wooded area with an object in its mouth and started playing with it on the lawn of a nearby apartment building. Moments later, the pet's owner went to inspect what appeared to be a large bone and screamed when she realized it was a human arm. The Springfield Police Department was called to the scene, and attending officers later recounted what they saw upon arriving at the woman's home. She took me to the rear door of her apartment, and in a bluish bag she handed me the arm of a female, said Officer J. Schwartz in his report. The lower left arm on the fingernails was a whitish nail polish. Search parties then scoured the Hudale Quarry behind the residential building. It wasn't long before they stumbled across an upper arm bone and then the rest of the body, face down and fully clothed in a small clearing atop a cliff inside of Springfield's Hudale Quarry. Chief Medical Examiner Bernard Ehrenberg was called to the scene where he pronounced the girl, who was unidentified at the time, dead. And dental records later confirmed the remains did in fact belong to Jeanette De Palma. She was found lying face down with a rock formation surrounding her body, Ehrenberg wrote in his medical examiner's report. He determined that an autopsy could not be performed because of the extreme decomposition. For this same reason, a cause of death could not be determined, so was listed as suspicious rather than a homicide. A skeletal examination and x-rays showed that the body revealed no evidence of bullet holes, fractures, or traumatic injury, according to the report. 
there were no drugs or any type of poison found in her system. For undisclosed reason, the coroner suspected that strangulation was the cause of death, but the actual cause of death has never been determined. No one was ever arrested in connection with her death, and no new leads have ever been publicly reported in the last 50 years. This is an old case. Old and cold. At the time of Jeanette's death, the nation was in the midst of a Christian revival known as the Jesus Movement. As the hippie generation was mellowing out, the families were turning to evangelical beliefs. Despite the turn to evangelical faith, it was also a period marked by paranoia of Satanism and witchcraft. Yeah, and Jeanette's death occurred three years after the infamous Manson family murder. With a lack of any concrete answers, theories about Jeanette's death have abounded for decades, ranging from satanic ritual sacrifice to a coven of witches practicing black magic. Yeah, as mentioned just a minute ago, the medical examiner noted in his report that a rock formation surrounded Jeanette's body. And around two weeks after the discovery of Jeanette's remains, several newspapers began reporting that she may have been the victim of an occult sacrifice carried out by either Satanists or by this local coven of witches who operated inside nearby Wachong Reservation. An article that appeared in the September 29, 1972 edition of the Elizabeth Daily Journal, entitled Girl Sacrificed in Witch Right, made the following claim. Investigations into the death of 16-year-old Jeanette De Palma is focusing on elements of black witchcraft and Satan worship. A review of the death scene photos, according to reports, is leading authorities to believe the girl's death may have been in the nature of a sacrifice. Pieces of wood, at first thought to be at the scene by chance, are now seen as symbols. One searcher said two pieces of wood were crossed on the ground over her head. More wood framed the body like a coffin. Another person who was there said, I guess if you were looking for signs, they were there. The article was the first publication to link Jeanette de Palma's death with witchcraft and Satanism. In an article published on September 30, 1972, in the Home News Tribune, the Associated Press wrote local authorities were, quote, investigating the possibility that black witchcraft and Satan worship were involved in the death of Jeanette. The report was attributed to an article in the Daily Journal of Elizabeth that was published a day earlier. According to the now defunct Daily Journal, the searchers who located Jeanette's body said they found, quote, pieces of wood crossed on the ground over her head. More wood framed the body like a coffin, like we just said. It didn't help that the cliff where Jeanette's body was found had been known to locals for several decades as the Devil's Teeth, since the rocks jutting up from the ground gave the impression of jagged teeth inside a skull. If you see it, you can understand why they call it that. Yeah, and I'll post, I have a, a picture I found that I'll post on our social media so you can see what we're talking about. But that obviously doesn't help to the hype. Right, I mean, that's, yeah. It just seems a little suspect. The New York Daily News was no better with their coverage either. On October 4th, 1972, the newspaper interviewed Reverend James Tate, who insisted that the devil's disciples killed Jeanette when she tried to spread the good word about Jesus Christ. She was so religious that she would often talk to friends and acquaintances about God, he said, adding that when the heathens were lectured about the power of Christ, their fanaticism arose and they killed her. Yeah, there was a rumor that authorities contacted this supposed coven of witches and brought one of them to the scene. Why? We don't know. They just brought her there. According to newspaper accounts and interviews, there were self-professed witches and warlocks in New Jersey at the time. An Associated Press article on Halloween 1972 interviewed a woman named Lilith Sinclair, who founded her own grotto, or group of Satanists, as an offshoot of the San Francisco-based Church of Satan. By all accounts, Sinclair's Grotto was based in the small Middlesex County borough of Spotswood and had more than 30 members. The witch who was reportedly brought to the site of Jeanette's body was never named. Well, for obvious reasons. They can't go pointing fingers at somebody like that or put their name out into public like that. Soon, there were so many rumors and theories that it became hard to discern what details were fact and what was merely hearsay. The details that Jeanette's body was found surrounded by sticks that had been formed into an outline of crosses and a coffin 
has lingered for decades, along with rumors that there were small crosses placed inside the coffin outline, rock formations around the body, and pentagrams and arrows carved into nearby trees. Now, around the crime scene, it was later rumored that there were dead animals that had been strung up to some trees with string, and there was also some mutilated corpses in jars. I think we should also note here that Springfield, New Jersey is only 32 miles from Jefferson, New Jersey, where in 1988, 14-year-old Tommy Sullivan brutally murdered his mother and attempted to burn down his house and kill his father and younger brother, then killing himself in the neighbor's yard, supposedly all in the name of Satanism. Now, we just covered that case a few months ago. Yes, well, at the time, Lauren, there were actually a couple of other incidents that took place in the same area within a couple hours, one fairly close that people will know. Now, these were within a short amount of time prior to Jeanette's murder that would sort of assist in sending these these thoughts of witchcraft or devil worshipping throughout the community. One of the more well-known cases, thanks to the new TV series, was John List. Now, John List, only one year prior to Jeanette's death, murdered his entire family, and List lived nearby in the town of Westfield. He claimed that he was helping his family by sending them to God. And during the trial, List's defense attorney, Elijah Miller Jr., even tried to introduce testimony that List's daughter, Patricia, who was only 16 years old at the time, was, quote, a practicing witch. Now, also, just a few months prior to the List case, another murder occurred involving Satanism and the youth of a New Jersey community. Now, Patrick Michael Newell, who was only 20 years old at the time, had two friends who bound his arms and legs behind his back, and they threw him into a sand pit in the town of Millville. Now, one of his friends told police that Newell, quote, belonged to a Satan worshiper sect and felt that he had to die violently in order to be put in charge of 40 leagues of demons. You can actually look that up, look up 40 leagues of demons, and it refers to this case. Now, the teen said that Newell had, quote, urged the two friends to bind him, which they did, and performed a satanic ritual, and then they pushed him into the pond. And according to the Times, these allegations steered the New Jersey State Police to, quote, investigate the possible existence of a voodoo cult. So now law enforcement is looking into this that particular case as, quote, a voodoo cult. So I can see where it would steer the investigation in Jeanette's case when someone – there was mention of – Satanism or occult or witchcraft. Wow, I didn't know that. At the time of Jeanette De Palma's death, the infamous satanic panic of the 80s was yet to come. But still, the publication of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, the popularity of the film Rosemary's Baby, and the freshness of the Manson family murders contributed to a growing belief in a sinister force from the underworld permeating American culture. Springfield Township, New Jersey, was no stranger to eerie tales of witchcraft and black magic, with one popular local story being that 13 witches are buried beneath the nearby Johnston Drive. Now, this is a lonely stretch of road that runs from the town of Wachung to Scotch Plains. Hey, my dad was born in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. Was he? Yeah. I had no idea. I'm going to ask him about that if he remembers anything about... Well, he moved here when he was like four. So he probably doesn't know anything about witches. No, but when he got here, you would think that he might have maybe some lingering, you know, find out where you come from and see what's around. Some claim to have seen human sacrifices in the area with their own eyes, which they accuse local authorities of covering up. Additionally, there had apparently been so much, so many thefts of occult reading material from the local library that works such as the Encyclopedia of Occultism actually had to be kept locked away. I blame I blame hard rock music. Maybe this is why it was so easy for the locals to believe such things were involved in Jeanette's death. Not only believe it, but run with it. But something even more strange about this case is that as quickly as the firestorm of news and rumors of witchcraft and whatnot started, it died down to nothing just as fast. Soon, no one would even mention Jeanette's name. Hey everyone, guess what? What? Paradise After Dark will be featured in the month of November in the True Crime Calendar. There's a True Crime Calendar? Yes, you can order it on podcastcalendars.com and use our promo code PARADISE for 10% off. There's 
also a pre-sale going on from now until November 30th for an additional 10% off. That is awesome. You know what? That would make an awesome Christmas gift. I know, right? Christmas is coming. So everyone, podcastcalendars.com and use code PARADISE. So, as we said just before the break, the talk of Jeanette's death and possible murder suddenly went silent. Locals who were interviewed for possible information on the case were reluctant or fearful to talk about it, and some flat out refused to discuss it, even amongst themselves. During this time, it seemed as if the death of Jeanette De Palma had become a taboo subject. Many of the leads police did get were sent through anonymous letters or phone calls that gave only the vaguest information and were unable to be verified. Police had absolutely nothing solid to go on. The case soon turned ice cold. I wonder if it has a lot to do with the fact that the police got tunnel vision because of all the witchcraft and the voodoo talk and the chat. So I think maybe it sort of steered the investigation in such a way to where even the public was scared of coming forward with information, afraid that they may be a next victim. Well, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Weird NJ Magazine began to report on the decades-old cold case after receiving several anonymous letters regarding Jeanette's death. According to WeirdNJ.com, in late 1997, Weird NJ received a letter from a fan named Billy Martin. The short letter, entitled In the Wachung Mountains, read, There was an alleged ritual sacrifice, I think, in the Hoodale Quarry near Springfield. A local dog brought a body part home to its master, leading to an investigation. I don't know if it's the truth or just a local myth. In the pre-Google era, the editors at Weird NJ struggled to find additional corroborating information regarding this incident. Eventually, it was decided to print Martin's letter in Weird NJ No. 9, released in October of that year. The letter's appearance ignited a small firestorm among Weird NJ readers who had grown up in Union County during the 1970s. Replies began to flood in, one of which finally put a name to the victim. Her name was Jeanette De Palma, and she was found on an altar, one letter writer wrote. When the editors of Weird NJ began their own investigation into Jeanette's unexplained death, they were immediately met with this resistance from local police, who claimed that all files and evidence relating to the De Palma case had actually been destroyed during flooding from Hurricane Floyd in 1999. After years of denials, correspondent Jesse P. Pollack was able to consult with former Union County Prosecutor's Office, Director of Communications Mark Spivey, in 2019 to submit a detailed file request under the New Jersey Open Public Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act to the Union County's Prosecutor's Office. After nearly two years of delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic and personnel changes, the Prosecutor's Office finally released the bulk of Jeanette De Palma's case file to Pollock in February of 2021. So now this is this is recent. This is not something, yeah, something you know. So right. We're still we're in the now times from a case that's 50 years old. And and if you think about it, Weird and Jay started investigating this in 1997. Correct. And didn't get the files until February of 2021. Now, so how many years is that? Like 24, 25? I don't. I, I'm not good with math. <laughs> 24. That's 24. Well. In this file, it includes some crime scene photos that had actually been previously described by some New Jersey police officials as, quote, missing. So think about this. These files were said by the police department, oh, they got ruined in the hurricane. They're not here. They're missing. We don't have them. Boom. There they are. Surprise, surprise. So after careful review of these photographs, Weird NJ feels confident that there was no occult activity involved in Jeanette's death. Why is that? The alleged crosses made from sticks and twigs and halo of stones that were supposedly found placed around Jeanette's body are completely absent from the crime scene photos. Also absent are any animal sacrifices that were long rumored by whispering Union County residents to be near the remains. 
The closest object resembling a cross found near the remains were two rotten tree branches that had obviously fallen in that spot a long time before Jeanette had come to rest there. No arrows carved in trees or an altar of any sort are seen in the photos either. A diagram drawn by the prosecutor's office investigator Glenn Owens shows these supposed signs of black magic and Satan worship are weak at best. The two pieces of wood crossed on the ground over her head were actually parallel to Jeanette's body with her right arm resting on the vertically parallel log and the other horizontal log laying just beyond her head. Both logs were much larger than Jeanette's entire body. Owen's diagram shows branches that had fallen in a way that roughly resembled an open rectangle, not a trapezoid or as other newspapers reported in 1972. But considering this was a densely overgrown patch of woods, it's probably safe to say that the Hoodale Quarry was filled with countless other branches that had also fallen into a common shape. Yeah, you know, Lauren, it, I, I, I'm going to stop you just for a second because I want to kind of interject this. If you look, and we'll probably post these, I have to laugh because some of the sketches that some of these people came up with showed like these logs and this, like you said, the trapezoid where it almost looks like a coffin surrounded by all of these crosses. Right. And you can actually see some of those pictures. And I, I, I've, I've seen some other information where people actually believe that that is in fact what the crime scene looked like. Well, if you look at the actual prosecutor's sketch or the investigator's sketch rather, you can see that it, it literally just looks like a wooded area. I mean, it, it, it is somewhat suspect in the way the stuff fell down. But you can understand why it would be somewhat natural in a heavily forested area that is, you know, sort of not – I'm not going to say it's traveled well. Right. So, you know, I don't know what I'm trying to say exactly. But it, I could see where maybe if somebody said something, maybe it would spark this whole, oh, my God. But I just don't see it's it. Like Do see, it's like seeing things in the clouds. You see a turtle in the clouds, you know. Yeah, Exactly. It's, it's not you what it is. You see a cross a, with some sticks laying on the ground. Exactly. I can understand that. I mean, if something falls over, something falls across it. It's not necessarily put that way. But if you look, are we? We're going to post this on our social media. Yes. So you'll get a chance to see exactly what we're what we're talking about here. Further, Donald Schwart, one of the Springfield police officers, we mentioned him earlier on the scene when Jeanette was found, told My Central Jersey in 2019 that he doesn't buy into reports trying to link the death to occult sacrifice and Satanism. I'm the one who found the body, Schwartz said. Even though he's been retired for three decades, Schwartz, 91 at the time of this interview, said the case still stands out in his memory. It was hard, he said. I had five daughters, and this could have been any one of my daughters, you know? Jeanette was found on top of a great big mound in the quarry. When we got up there, the body was laying right there. She had tan pants and a navy blue shirt. He said he believes that rumors started after other law enforcement officials were radioed and began climbing the rock face, and one guy noticed some rock or little stones around her head and all that, and he made the remark that it looked like Satan stuff. Schwartz's own theory from the way her body was positioned, is that they were probably doing drugs and she OD'd, although there is no evidence of drug use in the medical examiner's report. Somebody had to be with her because she had flip-flops on, Schwartz said, and I had hiking boots on and I had trouble getting up that little hill to where she was laying. He said there could have been more than one person with her because with flip-flops, she would have had a hell of a time getting up that hill. We figured after this period of time, somebody would maybe have a heart and say, I was there, or I know what happened, here's the truth. But nobody's come forward. Well, and one of the problems that we have with this case is because there's really no definitive answer as to how she died, it's really hard to approach this case. I know. You can't approach this case and say, okay, well, what, what friends could she have been up here doing drugs with? You can't approach this case with, okay, well, who had a vendetta? Who was her boyfriend? You know, I mean, it, it, there was no signs of anything that would sort of determine any direction for investigators to go. So it's understandable. The problem is, is they directed most of the 
case or the investigation rather into the search for someone witchcraft. I mean, they brought a witch to the scene. Yeah. Supposedly they brought a witch to the scene. Exactly. Well, the revelations contained in the documents obtained by Weird NJ were quite clear. There was no evidence of occult activity. There was no evidence of animal sacrifice or anything else that would suggest anything of a satanic nature. However, her necklace and her purse were stolen from her, suggesting this is a possible motive. So that's what we said. What would investigators look at? Well, that would be a good direction well, to go. I mean, she's – okay, so she's out in the woods on this hill called the Devil's Teeth and what – in flip-flops and what is she doing there and who just is like – a, a purse snatcher comes running by as if she's standing on a corner in New York City. Like, I don't buy the robbery thing. I just don't think that that could, if it was a homicide, I don't, I don't buy the robbery as a motive. I believe the robbery not necessarily as a motive, but I do believe the robbery is there to cover up what occurred or po not cover up what occurred, but to cover up who she was. They wanted to buy as much time as possible. Well, the contents of her purse were on the ground near her body, including her ID, I believe. But the actual purse was gone. I don't know if the purse was worth anything. You know, nowadays they have Louis Vuitton and Coach and whatever that are worth money. But I, I don't know in the 70s if they had that kind of stuff. See, that's odd. I did not know that. I did not, I did not find that to what, where the, the contents the were. The contents there. were poured out of the purse. The purse was missing and her necklace was missing. So this would definitely not be any type of motive. So theft is not a motive. I don't think so. So regardless of all that, still her, her cause of death obviously remains unknown and her death has not officially been declared a homicide. So we know that she, it, he said he suggested it. It could have potentially been a homicide, according to the medical examiner. However, this case to today still remains open. In an article about Jeanette's death in Weird NJ on WeirdNJ.com, they pose a few questions. First, obviously, why was her cross, necklace, and purse stolen from her body? Robbery? I don't think so. How did anyone inside the Springfield Police Department or the Union County Prosecutor's Office sincerely believe there was an occult element to this case while looking at these crime scene photos? There is no evidence of this in the photos. And I actually have the photos with the body redacted out of the photo. So I can post them on our socials. And all you can see is the surrounding area and you can see for yourself there's nothing there so why did so many police officials insist for almost half a century that Jeanette's case file and evidence had been destroyed in 1999 by flooding caused by hurricane floyd i think that maybe they knew about the like the witchcraft occult satanism hysteria and they were embarrassed because they knew the files and photos would show no such thing. So you think that if they come across anything that points in that direction, they just roll with that. And because it sort of got blown up, they are like, oh, shit, we can't we can't put these pictures out there. We can't let anybody see this stuff because if they investigate our work, they're going to see that we were pretty foolish. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> they're going to. Yeah. Foolish. They're going to feel foolish. Exactly. Because obviously they they got it wrong. So it's possible that law enforcement was looking to deter the public from their shortcomings in handling of this crime scene. You know, maybe they, maybe they fudged it. They didn't find the information they were looking for. Maybe they didn't find the things they're looking for. Or, hear me out. Let me get your thought on this. Because remember, this goes back to a long time and you got that, I don't know, for lack of a better term, that good old boy network that you would have where the community is tight, the sheriff's office is tight. What if, what if she were involved with someone at the sheriff's office? And something happened. What if a deputy is involved? What if the sheriff office was involved? Or someone in this small town was a relative of a sheriff or someone on law enforcement? Oh, so you're suggesting a cover-up. I'm not saying a cover-up. I'm saying a misleading information mm. situation. I'm not okay. saying – I'm, I'm not pointing my finger at the sheriff's office because I don't like to do that. I am definitely – 
I am, I'm pro blue for sure. What I'm saying is, in this situation in that small town, what if maybe she was involved with a relative of the sheriff or a family member of someone in law enforcement? I, I guess it's possible. Exactly. I mean, well, I mean the, the direction of this case just went totally in a whole different direction. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, it's possible. And, 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 and I, I'm going to bring this up and I'm, I'm, I'm going to hit you with this real quick. And I know that you're probably going to be like, what are you doing? But um, this is something I found on a website. Or actually not a website. This is – I follow a Facebook page. Yes, I'm old. I'm on Facebook. I'm a boomer. Um, I'm, I text a Gen You X. are a boomer? No, I'm a Gen X. Anyway, I just I say boomer because I get called that all you the time. You call me a, a millennial and I call you a boomer. I just get called the boomer by the Gen X. Or I'm a Gen X, but I get called boomer by – Teenagers all the time. My own teenager. Ken is a boomer. I'm not a boomer. But anyway, so. Let Nothing me, wrong with being a boomer. Stop My it. My parents are boomers. You're not trying to, you're not going to convince me that I am. <laughs> See, I, I, that's, that's what they call it gaslighting. What is that called? What's that called when you like try to convince me that I'm something? Let's get back to the case here. Okay, okay sorry. A, it, um, okay, boomer. Hey. So one thing that I want to kind of bring up, and I saw this again, it's, it's on Facebook. It was a, a page called Graveyard Shift, and it had to do with the Blair Witch Project. Now, everyone remembers the Blair Witch Project, the movie, right? I remember it specifically, and it was it was it was pretty amazing. I mean, at the time, I honestly thought that it was legit, and and this is this is kind of where I, I did think, too. I think this the, where this case could have gone in a different direction. So I'm going to read this real quick. It's called Behind the Scenes Facts about this Blair Witch Project. Said the Blair Witch Project might not get talked about these days when we're discussing the pantheon of classic horror movies, but it certainly deserves some conversation. The movie was a breath of fresh air for its time and essentially pioneered the found footage genre. While a bad sequel tarnished its legacy somewhat, the saga of the original Blair Witch Project is worth revisiting. People actually believe the hype. The movie hyped itself as actual found footage telling a true story. And this isn't true at all, of course. But in a time before social media, many people bought into it. Even IMBD or IMDB played into it by listing the three main characters as deceased. So even the even the, the movie thing, they put all this information out there and people believed that this was real actual footage. I did. I did too. So that's what I'm saying is in this situation, you've got poor Jeanette De Palma. She she's found dead. Regardless of what happened to her, her deaths still happened. It still exists. Or, you know, she's never been declared any type of whether it was a homicide or a suicide or drugs. They can only determine what they know it couldn't have been, which there was no drugs found in there. There was no bullet holes. There was, she was not cut. I mean, so it makes it really tough for investigators. And I think that maybe once the investigation took that occult satanistic turn that they started believing it so they thought wow and then of course the when the community gave up listening to people listening to the sheriff's office or wanting to engage the sheriff's office or talking about the case they backed off and i think they just believed the hype yeah similar to like the blair witch project and I, that kind of pertains to the case because that's the same thing you're in a situation where you've got all this this hype and people got scared. I mean, people were scared back then. I mean, it was, I mean, you're talking about very religious type areas. I mean, in all different types of religion in the new England area, there's a lot of people with all different religions. Right. The one religion that they all fear is Satanism. Yep. Cause that's the wrong God. And unfortunately I think that was the direction this case took. And it's very sad because poor Jeanette De Palma hasn't, hasn't had any justice. She hasn't had her family. It has no idea what happened. They believe it's all homicide. Everything I read says they can believe that she was, in fact, murdered, but no one knows how. Right. So if you have any information about Jeanette De Palma or her mysterious death, please contact the Union County Prosecutor's Office at 908-527-4500. And remember, there is a homicide task force that is assigned to the investigation into the death of Jeanette De Palma, and they claim that her case still today has never been closed and it is open. Well, are they actively investigating it? That I can't answer. Okay. So, Lauren, I guess that's going to be it. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. 
That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And on our Patreon, you don't just get exclusive content and early and ad-free episodes for Paradise After Dark. You also get exclusive content and early and ad-free episodes for Massacre on Muriel Court. That's my show. Yes, and um, shameless plug. Shameless plug. (laughs) So check out our website for the links to all of our social media, our merch store, and much, much more. Remember, hoodie season's coming. We have some great hoodies there, folks. Make sure you subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really, really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. And as always, thank you all so much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.